What's going on, guys? Sensible Prepper Live Prepper School. We are going to talk about some fun stuff today. Always bringing in the fun. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, we really appreciate Robbie Wheaton for being here uh, on Sweeten Arms. Make some of the best Glock aftermarket parts. The flat face trigger, his competition flat face trigger is by far the best. Uh, and does all the uh, upgrades for the Palmetto State Armory dagger. They, uh, they actually, that's an official uh, vendor for Palmetto State Armory. And, and I'll tell you one that we've had a lot of requests for lately has been uh, threaded barrels for the G43s and 43Xs. So we just finished up a production run of those and they went live on the website this morning. For oh. those of you that are looking for a threaded barrel for your 43 or 43X. And I can tell you from experience, you don't want to wait around because <laughs> they get gone in a hurry. <laughs> but uh, also he has the Robbie Wheaton YouTube channel and um, great to have him with us. Also, Sarah Mack is over uh, monitoring questions and she'll take questions whenever and then we'll take a break and she'll bring those questions up to us and we'll do our best to answer. them. Uh, also, <clears throat> we're going to talk about Exotac. Exotac makes some of the best fire starting tools on the market uh, down in Winder, Georgia. Uh, they're just excellent. And you get a 20 percent off <laughs> using Suits 20 with the link down below in the description. It doesn't take much to get me off track. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Exotac, we really appreciate them for sponsoring the, uh, the video today. And uh, they're, they've been my favorite fire starting tools for a long time. Uh, so with all that being said, we're going to get into 10 reasons uh, why you will fail during SHTF. And we're going to we're going to give you some solutions as well. But we're going to give you 10 things that you need to be ready for. And most of this is mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mindset is a big part of it. And, you know, the thing is, is in any traumatic type situation, uh, you've got to be strong. And so we're going to we're going to talk about these 10 things and we're going to kind of go into it a little bit. Um, I can sum it all up in just very, very short. Go ahead. you got to have some toilet paper to clean up your <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, SHTF, you need toilet paper. <laughs> and, you know, it was funny because when COVID hit, you know, that was one thing that really surprised me. Yep. Other than <clears throat> ammunition disappearing completely. Overnight. Overnight. Yep. Uh, you know, so here's the thing about um, survival. And this is the first, the first of this on the list is a failure to plan. Mm. But let me say this about about SHTF. You know, we can talk about all this stuff and a lot of times nothing happens immediately. And we get to where we just kind of go. Uh, and I've been there uh, where, you know, Shannon would come up and she'd say, uh, I read this somewhere and I'll go. Yeah, right. It's going to happen on Tuesday. And I'm going, OK, right. And nothing happens, you know, it's complacency. And, it's yeah. Complacency. Yeah. And you yeah, just it's really what it is. Exactly. We see this doom and gloom so much in in the mainstream media that everything is just awful, everything's terrible, and it, it, we're indoctrinated in this doom and gloom stuff. And instead of instead of staying above it and planning for things that that can happen, we're just like, oh well, yeah. it's never going to happen. Right. We hear this all day. We hear it every day. Nothing ever happens. Why should I do anything? Right. And it, it's a it's a problem. Now, here, this is the thing, though. SHTF doesn't happen in one day. Mm. It's incremental. So as things happen, there are little things that continue to happen. Look back 10 years ago and tell me that things haven't changed. Uh, tell, tell me that we're not more vulnerable than we've ever been. Uh, you know, we've got two possible wars that we could be facing, two very huge enemies. Uh, with China and with um, with Russia mm -hmm. and with other threats, uh, you know, and a lot of this stuff has just happened over the past few years. It's escalated. And so really, the first thing you need to do is to plan. Failure to plan is definitely something that will get you killed in an SHTF situation. Um, you know, the thing is, prepper means to prepare. And we prepare for things that are survival, that keep us surviving. And, you know, whether it's food, water, medical, all the different aspects of prepping. But again, we become complacent, like Robbie was saying, because we don't really believe after a while that anything's going to happen. That anything bad's going to happen. That's right. 
That's right. But it incrementally <clears throat> happens. Um, one thing that for Fowl said in the modern uh, the mo modern survival guide for the coming economic collapse, which I have one right here, uh, and I mention this almost every time because this is so relevant. It's about the uh, actual events that happened down in Argentina uh, back in 2001. And then they've gone through this a number of times since mm -hmm. then. Uh, and one of the things he said was, it's not that there was just this one day of SHTF. He said, what happened was, is the, is the peso began to get less and less valuable and crime started going crazy. And that was the big tipping point. Uh, and guys, we're seeing that right now in Every the U S right day. now. So, you know, a lot of people doom and gloom, doom and gloom. No, get prepared and be prepared. And then you can weather the storm. And that's what this is all about. Um, and so, you know, we, we can stick our head in the sand. But here's the other thing. You plan, you get that plan together. You know, you've worked on this. You know, you, you think this is what I'm going to do. And then you don't implement the plan. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think, you know, and I'm, I'm guilty of this myself. Oh, I need to do this. Oh, I need to do. And then I don't get around to it next year. I need to do this. I still <laughs> haven't done it. And so, you know, really the failure to plan is part of it. But actually planning is another segment. And let me see. I, I wanted to make sure because we've got a lot of a lot of things that I want to make sure that we cover. But uh, one thing about being prepared and making a plan is it gives you peace of mind. It allows you to have a point to where you can start to put things together. You know, it's just like for me, my date book. A lot of times I'll write down little things all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so the other day I went, OK, this is getting out of hand. So then I, I took all these little notes that I had and I put them in my calendar and it kind of brought it all together. And so now I'm like, OK, what have I got next Wednesday? I look on there and I go, oh, perfect. Yep. We've got a, in fact, next Wednesday, we're having a Patreon cigar bar. We're going to the Bogota Pipe or Boda Pipes, and we're going to have cigars that night. And, you know, it was on my list. It's ready to go. I was able to invite Robbie. But, you know, having a plan and put it together gets you started. And so having that plan. Now, number two is in action. And that's really just not doing anything. Again, this can relate back to, you know, Oh, this is how, oh, they're talking about this. Oh, mm -hmm. we're talking about that. And while it doesn't necessarily affect us every day, unless you go to the grocery store and you go to ga the gas station, mm -hmm. you go to, you know, wherever you're, you're buying things and you're watching prices go through the roof and they are. So, you know, inaction is a killer because we just sit around and we don't do the things we need to do. You know, a lot of times it's denial, which yep. is part of the first <clears throat> thing we talked about. Yep. And then it's actually implementing a plan, be implementing, putting it together, getting the things you need. I mean, how many of us have everything we need? Oh, no one. <clears throat> well, you know, the reality is we probably have everything we need. We might not necessarily have everything we want for every specific situation. You know, there's, and that's, you know, that's one of those areas where, you know, you can go extreme one way or the other with, with your wants and your needs. You know, there's, there's the things that we need to survive every day, but then there's things that we want to be able to survive every day that will make our lives a lot easier. Right. So it's just like a new firearm. Yep. You know, many of us have as many firearms as we really need. Now, not everybody, some people need to, you know, to step that up. But for the guys of us that are gun guys, I mean, Robbie and I will go buy a gun, <laughs> but we don't need another gun, you know. But the fact is, is what areas are we missing? So I might say, well, you know, I don't have medical. Yep. I need to get my medical up. But then, and I'm like, man, but that's going to be $500 to get all the supplies I need. Oh, but look at this shiny new Glock that just came out. And so before long, you're putting off what you really should be doing mm -hmm. for something that you just have an emotional attachment to. Oh, but that's about prepping. It's a gun, yep. you know, Oh, it's this, it's that. So make sure that you prioritize. So when you're, when you're in that state of inaction, it can be in different ways, but inaction, when you look at it financially, you know, I can't afford that. I can't do that. Then don't go out to eat one night mm -hmm. and you can afford quite a bit because <clears throat> yeah. 
prices on food are out of sight, you know, and then you give a 20 buck tip, you know, by the time you take your whole family out and you could have used that for something that's really going to help you and get you with a peace of mind. And listen, that's the one thing about prepping is it puts you in a better state. It gives you peace of mind. Mm-hmm. You, you know, that's, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head <coughs> with, uh, with saving money. You know, the majority of us probably spend more money eating out than we do on anything else during the month. That's true. <clears throat> you know, if you if you go through and figure out how much money you spend in an entire month eating out compared to everything else, compared to your preps, compared to everything else you spend money on, you probably spend more money on eating out than you do anything else. That's true. That's true. And, you know, or it's maybe an extravagant vacation. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's, you know, taking a trip somewhere. I mean, we just went to the lake last weekend. We got us a little cabin. We got rented us a boat while we were down there. I mean, we we spent some money. And then I come home and go, well, I don't have enough money for this. So, you know, prioritizing mm. and then being able to put that into place. Yep. But guys, inaction will kill you. Uh, you know, I remember when uh, when COVID hit, and you know, and and even though it was a, you know, because we don't know where these things can come from. Mm. So COVID hits and then I'm like, Oh, uh, what, what am I going to do? What, what, you know, what, what are we going to do? And then I look back and I stop and I go, oh, well, you know, we, we've got, we're good. We're mm-hmm. good. There's some things we need, you know, and some things we want to do, but w- it puts you in a much better place to be able to make a decision for yep. what you do need. So toilet paper was one of those things that had a stock of it, but we didn't have enough. Well, you know, I think that was one of those things that was a hole in a lot of people's preps that they didn't realize was a hole in their preps. Right. Well, usually, you know, you, you go through the toilet paper and then all of a sudden you're down to one roll and you go, whoop, I better go to the store. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, having those supplies that are going to be really vital to you later on. Uh, so in action, you got to change that. You know, you need to put some discipline into it. In fact, I've got a shirt on right now. This is Jocko Willink. And um, it's, you know, dis, um, discipline equals freedom. And when you dis- discipline yourself to do what you need to do, then it gives you a lot more freedom. And that discipline keeps you from doing things that you don't want to do, like go out and buy a brand new knife when you've got five sitting there in the drawer. <laughs> Uh, and so it just gives you that. And one thing I do want to mention, too, and this is a sidestep, but, you know, I did a video on um, lessons from the Civil War. And, you know, two thirds of the soldiers that died, died of illness, sickness, dysentery, all that yep. stuff. Listen, guys, honestly, in a real grid down situation where medical attention may be lacking, you need to seriously get yourself in good shape with your meds and your medical. Uh, and your sanitize, your uh, you know, being sanitized, your hand sanitizers, mm-hmm. your um, your bandages to be able to treat wounds and clean them. That is a major thing. And if nothing else, you get out of what we're talking about today. Get your medical ramped up because that is going to be the number one killer. Yep. As well as purified water. Yeah. Oh yeah. <clears throat> water is yep. water is just incredibly vital. So inaction sometimes can be just low self-esteem. You know, it's like, well, I don't know. I, I don't know if I should do that. And indecision and you can't decide. That's why making a plan and being able to implement that plan will help the inaction to turn into action. So very important to do that. OK, now, number three, and we kind of switched this around on our board, but panic. Again, COVID, I look around, I kind of go, <gasps> What, 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 what's going on? You know, and I had that little bit of sense of panic until I stopped and I looked and said, okay, these are my assets. Let me just take a deep breath. Let me relax. Panic will cause indecision. It's chaos. It's absolute maddening. You'll make bad decisions. You'll make rash decisions. And so you've got to quell panic. How do you quell panic? Well, you know, for me, one of the easy ways to quell panic is to make an informed decision based on the information that I have at hand. And, you know, that be that making a decision on the food that I have, the water that I have, or where are we going to stay? Are we staying where we are? Are we moving somewhere else? Is, oh, and COVID is a great example, you know, with as far as like 
sheltering in place and staying at home, you know, which is something that, you know, it's like, like right now, you know, we're seeing a uptick again in different viruses and stuff, COVID, the flu, whatever. It's that time of year, you know, kids are back in school. Everybody, people are around each other more. They're spreading germs and viruses and stuff. And we always see an uptick in sickness this time of year. Same thing around uh, Christmas and New Year's. You know, we travel, we go to visit with friends and family over the holidays, and we see a big uptick in illness around the 1st of January. But making a decision based off of that information, you know, do, do I want to kind of stay away from people the first couple of weeks of September because I know that they've been traveling and I know that they've been around people? And that's going to help minimize my... Uh, Fear, potential panic. for getting what potential for getting sick as well as my my panic for for being exposed to people. That's right. 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 And and you're making irrational decisions. Yes. Uh, just <clears> like <throat> you see somebody driving down the road by themselves with a mask on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is panic. That is irrational decisions. And what's even worse is it's causing health issues that they don't even understand with that mask over their face. Okay, so panic is something, and the way to, to fix panic, number one, is to take a deep breath, look at what you have, and then take action and move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a grid-down situation, if you don't have anything and SHTF hits, then panic is going to be really close. Yeah. It'll be easy to fall into panic. So another reason why, make your plan and enact that plan. Number four is fear. Listen, guys, everybody experiences fear, everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think we've gotten to a place in our society where fear is overtaking a lot of people. Yeah. Anxiety, you know, being worried about things, mm -hmm. worried about things that honestly they could help, but they just don't. Yeah. Uh, having social fears. Or the exact opposite, worried about things that you have no control over whatsoever. And which makes it even worse for you because you're worrying about something that you have no ability to alter the course of whatever it is you're worried about. Right. right. Which is one of the worst things to ever worry about because right. you, you don't have any control over it. That's true. That's a good <clears> point. <throat> you know, it's just like a lot of people are worried about things that maybe the federal government's doing, they're spending money, they're doing this, they're doing that. There's mm. corruption and there's all this stuff and you start following it on the news and you're like, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh. Oh, this is awful. This is awful. There is nothing you can do about that. No. There is nothing. So, no. One thing that you have to do is is you need to be in a you need to be aware of what's going on. Yes. But you need to focus your attention on what you can change and what you can do. Which parallels with making a plan, implementing that plan, taking fear and panic and putting it aside. And you know, okay, you know what? It is what it is. Let's get it done. Mm -hmm. And I think just manning up or womaning up, <laughs> if that's even a term, <laughs> but, you know, getting serious about what you have to do and logically putting it together and putting it into action. You know, John Wayne said, you know, when fear comes, a man just saddles up anyway and heads right out to it. You know, you, you can't let fear control you. Everyone fears. It's what you do in the place of fear that brings more confidence to you. So if you're afraid, figure it out. Go, you know what? This is happening. Let's fix it. What I can fix, just like Robbie said, you yep. can't fix things, can't worry about things that you can't help. You know, if you're worried about a nuclear bomb, you can't worry about, well, what's Russia going to do? Or what's, your, oh, you know, and get all worried instead of going, okay, let's get some potassium iodide. Let's get some, uh, you know, a Geiger counter. Let's get some things. If that's what your fear is, then Implement something to take care of that fear. If you're living somewhere and crime is everywhere, put together a plan, you know, be more situational aware, make sure you have a firearm if it's, you know, for self-defense or pepper spray or, you know, a flashlight to be able to use. Make sure that you have some things in place that when and if you are attacked in any way, you have, you, you're not just called unawares and you're not just walking around in fear. You have a plan. And that will take care of a lot of yep. things. Now, Sarah Mac, we're going to be going to questions here in just a minute. So I just want to give you a heads up. Uh, but, you know, fear really comes a lot of times from just inaction. 
you're, you're just, and I, it, it freezes you. It, it paralyzes you. And that's one thing that you have to do is to make that and move forward. And, well, and with fear, you have, you haven't developed a plan and you haven't trained for how to handle that situation. And what happens when you don't have a plan and you haven't trained nine times out of 10, you're going to freeze in the face of fear. Right. Right. And that is the whole purpose of planning, of training, of doing all of these things. A lot of the mental things that, that we go through every day to help alleviate that fear and to help develop our mind to deal with fear in, in that situation so we don't freeze in a fearful situation and we're able to focus and move forward in the face of fear. Right, right. You know, it was funny, the old movie Aliens. Mm-hmm. And Bill Paxton was one of the uh, the uh, space Marines. Yep. And I'll never forget. It's the first time I'd ever seen him in a movie. And the whole time he was going, man, we're going to be screwed. Man, they're coming through. Man, we're done for. We're going to die, man. We're just going to die. And he just kept on and on through the whole movie. You know what happened to him? He got wiped out. Yep. <laughs> but so did everybody else except uh, Sigourney Weaver. But, you know, the thing is, it's just that negative And it's just like, <laughs> you know, you've got to go, okay. This is the situation. Let's fix it. Let's do what we can to take care of it. Improvise, figuring things out. Use your imagination, use your creativity. And fear will paralyze all of those things. So it's very important to have more of a clear mind and to be able to go, okay, you know what? Yeah, that's bothering me. I think that's that's a problem. But what can we do to mitigate it? All right, let's go to some questions. Uh, Gary Hernandez, Self-Defense and Urban Survival says, Hello, gentlemen. My question is when SHTF I feel that going out at night would be the best way to check on things as well as get supplies. What is your take on that? Thank you, Gary. I I think that's a a smart move. You know, the one thing is, especially if you're traveling, you want to travel at night. You don't want to be vulnerable to everyone that's out there. And, um, you know, it does kind of conceal things. You're able to, to get around a little bit better. Um, you know, last night I was doing some, a flashlight review and I was outside. And one thing that I do, and if you ever watch my flashlight reviews, I am going through our property, (laughs) different spots all over. And I'm walking around. And one time it hit me, uh, because my dad had an incident one time where he called me and he said, Hey, I think there's somebody beating on my door. So I, I took off over there and it was very comforting knowing the area. Mm -hmm. I knew where everything was. I knew where the hiding spots were. I'd been down through them, looking through, actually demonstrating a flashlight. But through that, I really picked up a lot of cues on things. Last night, I was right behind our house and I'm walking back there and doing stuff. And I was thinking, here's a place that could somebody could be. Here's a place. This is a blind spot. This is an area. And I was able to put all that together. But yeah, traveling and knowing knowing your area at night, you know, knowing around your property, knowing around, you know, that's that home field advantage. Mm-hmm. And at night, that really comes into play. So definitely, I think that's a great um, thought process. Away from home, though, is a little different situation. You know, if you're in an area you're trying to get home and you're in an area where maybe you don't know the terrain, you don't know the area very well, uh, you don't know the people very well. You can still travel at night, but your movement is going to be a lot slower. Uh You're not going to be covering nearly as much ground. Um, You're having to be much more aware of everything that's going on around you. You know, every little twig that snaps, every leaf that falls, every rattle in the trees, you know, you're stopping and you're looking, assessing before you move forward. So a lot of times traveling at night in an area where you don't know, can be good, but it's going to be very time consuming and you're not going to make a whole lot of ground up. That's a good point. Uh, Gio asks, where is the best place in the U S to go and survive off land when SHTF? Well, probably away from any kind of nuclear facilities or military bases, uh, things like that. You know, the Midwest is a great area, uh, as long as you're not right there, you know, in those areas, Mm -hmm. um, you know, anywhere that's, here's the thing. Sometimes, uh, sparsely populated areas are better, but sometimes they're not. Uh, one of the reasons it was, in fact, in uh, for Fowl's book, he talked about it. He said people bugged out. They had cabins and, mm-hmm. and they went to those places. And then not long after that, these gangs and roving bandits went up and took all their stuff and killed them. Um, and so, you know, strength in numbers is a really important thing. Yep. 
but too many numbers can be a problem. So if you're in a real urban or highly suburban area, you know, you probably want to be away from that, but then you're also going to be away from supplies and resupply. So, um, you know, really the best thing to do is, is to have, and we're going to get into this in a minute, but, but having friends, families, uh, neighbors that you can trust and, and kind of build uh, some camaraderie with that uh, as far as being prepared. Uh, Walt says, are there sensible priced water filters that are good besides the high priced ones today, uh, AKA Berkey? You know, and Berkey's are almost impossible to get. Uh, people are buying up water filters like crazy. Uh, there's some different systems out there. We've been using the Berkey for 12 years and, um, you know, we've had a really good success. They do. They did have a lawsuit. There was some stuff going on, but it's very vague and we're having trouble finding them out. Um, but, you know, the, the easiest is or not the easiest, but one of the first is just taking, you know, grass and sand and charcoal and running your water through it and then running it back through it. And that's a natural way to filter water. Uh, but, you know, as far as any certain filter systems, there's a lot of different ones that are out there that have come there up are, lately. <clears throat> there's a bunch of stuff out there. You know, one of the big things, uh, and I've actually been watching quite a few uh, YouTube videos on this are guys that will buy different water filter systems and they'll filter like creek water, really contaminated water through the filter. And then they'll put uh, samples of the water that's been filtered under a microscope and check for microorganisms under a microscope from you know, they look looking for bacteria. They're looking for uh, you know, single celled amoebas and different things like that. And from everything that I've seen, the water filters that are out there, these guys are not finding any type of microbes or anything that could make you sick in the uh, post processed water from a lot of different water filters on a lot of different companies. So it is, it's pretty, been pretty eye opening uh, how well these filters do work as as far as uh, stripping out different contaminants from the water that can make you sick. But one problem sometimes is man made materials, pesticides, heavy right. metals, things like that. Uh, you know, can also be a problem. But um, you know, that's one thing. And you know, honestly, I haven't done a whole lot of research since that time. But you know, if you're looking at some of these just basic home filters with the little, you know, the jug and you pour the water, those are not going to take care of a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and treating it with Clorox as well or bleach yep. also helps. Uh, but you know, go. Well, you can watch some of those videos, and I think you'll get a good idea of what they're using. Uh, Sun Double Sixty Two asks: Any videos on cleaning those Olight weapons lights following a trip to the range? <laughs> <laughs> I just did that last night. That was one of the things I was doing. Um, you know, sometimes the lens gets really messed up. I'll, I'll just be honest, because I shot quite a bit, and I was even shooting twenty two last night, which is so dirty. It's just like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the. Um, you know, I just wipe those lenses down uh, and they're typically mineral glass lenses. Mm. You can get that clean pretty easily. I've found. Um, but and that's putting together. I've shot. In fact, some of the we've done some testing of 5000 rounds for some of these uh, these Olight weapons lights. And yeah, they get dirty and the guns get super hot. And um, and so but we haven't really had a, a big deal about getting them clean. Yeah, I use isopropyl alcohol and Q-tips. Mm. Um, it doesn't damage the lenses. <clears throat> it dries and evaporates really quickly. So you don't leave any kind of streaks or anything on your lenses. And uh, I, I've had good results with that. Okay. Let's, uh, we're going to come back to questions. We want to stick with our list right now. Um, okay. Number five is lack of training. And Robbie started touching on that. But here's the thing, guys no one is born a warrior. Mm. No one is born a survivalist. It is a developmental process that goes into that. You have to start from somewhere and then your hunger and your curiosity will help you to start growing in it. But then you have to continue to maintain it. Uh, one thing that's funny is a lot of times, and, and Robbie's the same, is when we go to the range and we're shooting and people go, wow, how do you keep that gun so flat? I'm shooting the same gun you are. It's just that because we have trained and we figured out how to mitigate the recoil, how to get our grip just right, you know, how to do all these things, 
Now, does does that mean we don't miss sometimes? Sure. Does that mean I don't flinch sometimes? Sure. You know, it just happens. Some of it's recoil anticipation. But, you know, the thing is, is because we have done this over and over and over and over, you know, we're starting to master that. And and we're not a Jerry Michelin, you know, that can do whatever he does. But it took years for him to master it, to take care of it. Listen, you 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 haven't started any fires. You haven't gone out and done some camping. You haven't set up a shelter. Uh, you haven't filtered water. You know those basic survival skills. Um, you know uh, we went to um, Fieldcraft Survival. Went to a survival school that they were doing, and you know, and I've been doing prepping for years. But you know, it was funny. I learned so much because it just helped me to improve my skills. Mm-hmm. And so continuing, but and that's the thing. There's you're there's always things you can learn and that's one of the great things about training is you're continuing to improve and you know become a master of different skills and you know, that's for me that's one of the things that drives me is, is to become better and better and better at different things uh, whether it's whether it's shooting or whether it's you know gardening homesteading all of these things are things that I want to be better at personally and it motivates me and, and drives me every day to continue to be better at things by improving myself through, through different training, different types of training. Right. Right. And again, discipline equals freedom. The more that you discipline yourself to do these things, guys, we have a lot of time wasters in our life Mm -hmm. and a lot of it has to do with social media. Uh, you know, we, we get on there or TV or watching some shows yep. or we're binge watching or we're playing games or we're doing whatever. And th- there's nothing wrong with some of that as long as it's done, you know, in moderation. moderation. Yep. But making sure that you are improving your life. Uh, when I was a kid, we didn't have all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So we're out there building bridges <laughs> and tree forts and rope bridges and out there making fires and fishing and we're doing all this building ramps and jumping them with bicycles with no helmets on, you know, I mean, skateboarding with no pads on and leaving our DNA all over the place. But, you know, we had a leg up and I've watched the the kids today. They just don't have, uh, they have too many distractions. It's Mm -hmm. not that they probably want to do it. And, you know, my son's really funny. Uh, my youngest son, he'll sit there and watch this video of something being made. And, and it's very fascinating. And he's sitting there watching that, you know, watching it. And I'm kind of thinking, man, it would it would be great for him to be able to do that, for him to be able to, because it really interests him. But if not, and the same thing with you watching this video, if you're not careful, you're gaining all this information, you know, but then you're not doing anything with it. And so training and being more of a warrior, um, you know, a few years ago, I took martial arts for 30 years and then hadn't in a long time. And then my daughter really was wanting to get back into it. And so we got back into martial arts and it's it's something that you're developing. You're continuing to develop. And so, you know, it's it's a discipline. You master it. So training, whether it's medical training, firearms training, you know, Red Cross Blue Shield, you're getting a ham radio license. These things take time. You're not a master at one point. Years ago, I read this book and it was talking, it was a science fiction book and people were bestowed the ability to do whatever. And so this one guy, he he always wanted to play the guitar. He'd never even played a guitar and he got bestowed this, this gift of where he could play the guitar. So he's sitting there playing and his fingers just started bleeding and rubbing them raw (laughs) to the point that he got down to the bone. It takes years to master and it takes that you know, calluses and everything else. A girl got it. She she all of a sudden had the gift of being able to do ballet, but her body was not conditioned and her mm-hmm. muscles all tightened up and they twisted up and, and she was in severe pain. Same thing, guys. If you're expecting that you, you see all this stuff and you want to do this, but you never do it, it's the same kind of, of uh, principle. You've got to put in the time. Okay. Now, lack of teamwork. Lack of teamwork can go in a number of different directions. Uh, but first off, I always recommend guys is to have a group, if it, at all possible, put together like-minded friends, family, neighbors, whoever, and and have some sort of group. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, we have regular meetings every week and we do this and that, which we do uh, because we have people that want to do that. 
but having people in your life and being the kind of person that draws people to you, not repels. Get rid of your ego. Just get rid of that. Get rid of your pride and back up and work as a team. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that I think ego and pride are two of the biggest things that really prevent uh, groups from succeeding. You know, you end up with someone in the group that has a huge ego or, you know, because of their pride, they're not willing to bend to to make things better for the group because they don't want to concede something that they consider that's very important, even though it's for the betterment of the group. Pride and ego will ruin a good group of people that are working together quicker than anything. We take a basketball team, for instance, mm -hmm. you have one guy that's really good and he's always shooting the ball. Always. Yep. He doesn't work with the team. And the team never does all that great because he's always the one with the ball and he gets it. They know he's going to shoot it, you know? So, you know, but here's the thing. Don't get involved in groups like that. If mm -hmm. you've got people in your life that have big egos, it can cause a lot more problems in the long run. Yep. Uh, so make sure that if you associate yourself with people, people that are in a team type mentality, and in fact, it's like our prepper group. I put it all together, but I've told them up front. I said, I am not the leader of this group. I am one of the leaders and we're going to work together because it's important to work together. And so just make sure. But also, if you're one of those people that has a big ego and you're very proud of what you've accomplished and, and you know, well, I've, I've been a... Uh, special forces seal all my life and y'all are just trash, you know, and I'm going to make all the decisions. Well, you know, if he made it to seals, he's probably a smart guy, but he needs to have some humility. And so working together with those people and yet conceding people to people that have more better abilities than you as well. And that works out too. Okay. Uh, number seven is loneliness. You know, it was one of the things during COVID. It was kind of we were isolated from others. Mm -hmm. We still had our family around, you know, but after a while, you just kind of, you know, you don't get to hang out. You know, that's one that I think it didn't impact me a whole lot because I, I still saw my I still saw my friends. I still talked to my friends pretty regularly, was around my friends pretty regularly. I saw that the loneliness impact my children mm -hmm. more more than more than a lot of adults. Right. Because they were used to going to school. They were used to going to their, their different sports that they were doing. They were used to their group of friends that they saw every single day. And they were used to their friends. They saw at school every day and hung out with, they were used to their friends that they saw at practice right. every day, you know, I mean, six days a week, two and a half hours a day. They're with their friends in the pool, you know, doing, doing their swim practice and stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, overnight that's gone. Right. And, uh, you know, that, especially my, my oldest little boy, that it really impacted him pretty hard. And, and he even talked to me about it quite a bit. He was like, you know, I've, I never realized how important being around my friends was until I didn't have the opportunity to be around them. Right. Right. And it was, it was, it was prolific for me, the impact that, him not having his friends around him and being able to talk with them and just hang out and stuff. Uh, the impact that it had on him and the amount of loneliness that he felt because of that. Right. Well, you know, some people are more social. Some people need more of that. Mm -hmm. Some people don't. Uh, me personally, I, it's funny. I can just sit by myself and do whatever yep. I'm doing. But I found out that hanging out with friends like Robbie and I will after the live, we'll sit here for an hour. I think last week it was three hours. Yes. We'll sit there and hang out <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, be able to talk. And, and but here's the thing in, in the show survivor, man, um, I believe it's survivor, man. Uh, a lot of the guys that were out there in those remote isolated areas by themselves, that was the one big thing that mm -hmm. freaked them out because they were all by themselves. And you may find yourself by yourself in a situation. And so that's where middle toughness, that's where, you know, having, honestly, you're, you're isolated, your thoughts start to take over. And then what happens is, is you start to lose uh, your cause to live, your will to live. And so it's very important to make sure that you have a cause knowing 
why you're doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. and then focusing on those things. Let's say my family. I mean, my family's a definite cause. I'm going to survive because I want them to survive. Even when chips are down, even when the odds are against me, yep. I'm going to fight to make sure that I protect my family. So one of the things we we're talking about, a long distance get home bag. If you're six days away or a hundred, you know, a thousand miles away from your family, and it's going to take you a month, two months to get home, you have a cause. And so you're going to be determined to get there. You do. But even with that, even with that cause, you have to set goals, mm -hmm. short-term goals that are achievable. Right. Because otherwise that cause will quickly become out of reach. And you're like, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to cover this thousand miles. Right. You know, because that goal or that, that cause and that goal is so far out ahead of you that it appears to be unreachable. Right. So you, that's where you have to set small achievable goals for yourself that you're able to accomplish every day. And those are going to be great for keeping your self-esteem up, keeping yourself motivated. Hey, I did this today. I set this goal and I achieved this today. And those goals can change based on you know, your physical fitness, based on your uh, the food that you have. Do you have the energy? You know, are you fatigued? Are you able to, to keep up with your goals and your pace that you've set for yourself every day to be able to get home? It's a it's a moving target. It's something that you have to change and you have to adjust every day and sometimes multiple times a day to be able to still meet those goals just based on, on you know, circumstances around you. And that goes to our next one is endurance. Uh, having the endurance. And a lot of that has also to do with calls, having a cause, being able to call it up, having goals, um, being fatigued, uh, you know, not having physical ability, like we yep. talked about just now, all those things play into just endurance. Uh, you know, one thing that um, well, one a lot of people don't think about is everyone, when, when you talk about endurance, everybody always thinks about the physical side of it. But mental endurance mm, mm -hmm. is as important or more important than the physical endurance, because if your mind fails you because you you don't have the mental endurance to continue, even if physically you're fine, there's nothing wrong with you. You're able to continue driving on. But if you fail because of a lack of mental endurance, it will take you out of the fight 100 percent of the time. Well, World War II. At the beginning of World War II, um, France had the largest army. They had the most tanks. Mm -hmm. They had the Maginot Line. They, I mean, they were really well equipped. They're uh, equipped. <laughs> they were equipped. They were equipped, actually. But, you know, they were very well e equipped to stand against the German army. Mm -hmm. But the German army rolled right over them. Now, there's a, some different reasons. But one of the biggest things is that they felt a sense of defeat right up front. They just thought we're going to be taken. We're going to lose. We're going to do. It. And, and that was the big thing, the great defeat. And that's what took France down. Yeah. You know, the Germans even said, they said, and you know, they were called the frogs, just like all the different countries have different nicknames. And they said the frogs felt fought very well. They fought very well, but they just assumed they were going to be defeated. And then came back with the resistance and really, you know, wrecked havoc on the Germans. But, you know, the thing is, is you've got to have a cause and you've got to have a goal in mind to be able to overcome. And you've got to say, you know what, I can do this. You know, we see it all the time in movies. You know, we'll have some adventure movie or something and the guy will get down to a certain point and He's like, I just can't go on. And then something happens to where he's like, I'm going to do it. And they just do it. And we we applaud that. But we've got to make sure that we have what that takes. And a lot of times we don't have the lack of confidence. We have a lack of confidence, low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. We don't think we can do it. And that's where planning and training and taking action and overcoming your fear and all of these different aspects will help you to be mentally tough and give you the, the ammunition to be able to move forward. If you don't have any of those and you come against this insurmountable odds, yep. <laughs> it's like, okay. You know, we, we just can't do it. Well, and you have to make sure as well that you have the right mental mindset to be able to continue on when things get hard. 
you know, if if things get tough and things get hard and you, you know, your your mind just tells yourself, I, I just can't do this. I just can't continue on. I'm I'm done. I'm tired. I'm weak. I'm old. I'm 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 whatever, whatever, whatever. That is your mental endurance failing you and breaking down. And, and that's where you have to start preparing your mind and training your mind now to maintain a very positive attitude and not allow yourself to sink into that negative mindset. When, you're, when your mind starts drifting off on its own into these wild, crazy thoughts that it has, you know, with, with no sense of direction whatsoever, and it takes you down this negative rabbit hole, you have to stop your mind from allowing it to do that. And you have to redirect it in a positive direction. Right. That's right. Okay. Number nine is ex uh, prolonged exposure. Uh, now, one of the problems is, especially if you're out, is or even at home with lack of power mm -hmm. and you got heat and you got cold and you just got, you know, you're never satisfied. You can't, you know, you can't get comfortable because you're just being exposed to whatever, exposed to the elements, a lack of food. You know that will play my that'll play games on your mind. Oh yeah, a lot of times, especially with um, especially with special forces, um, sleep deprivation is something mm -hmm. that's good to train. Uh, food deprivation, where you don't have the food, guys. I'm telling you, when I if I haven't eaten, yeah, uh, in the afternoon, I've skipped lunch, and all of a sudden I'm kind of going, I can't even hardly think. Put that in a super stressful situation, and man, it really ramps up. Well, you know, I think that's why fasting is so important. Hmm. You know, that's one of the, whether it's intermittent fasting or fasting for 24 hours or fasting for 48 hours, fasting is very, very important because it, it teaches you that you can be successful without things that you feel like you have to have every day. Right. Yeah, and fasting is, right. is a very easy way to start training your body to endure things that you, that you don't think that it can endure. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, in the, when I've done that and, and a number of times it, you, your enamel on your teeth actually comes back. Mm -hmm. You, you're actually more healthy. Yeah. You've kind of gotten rid of a lot of the things that we just have in our bodies and it kind of cleanses us. So well, it allows your body to have a rest because you're not constantly processing things. You know, you're, Normally we're eating or snacking or whatever on something pretty much all day long. So our, our, <laughs> our body is constantly processing food. Our, uh, you know, our insulin, we're getting insulin spikes. We're getting insulin crashes all day long because we, we eat sugar or we eat carbohydrates or whatever, which, which is still just sugar, but we're, we're spiking and, you know, up and down and up and down in this roller coaster from our body processing stuff all day long and a fast, allows your body to reset from that. Well, I must have fasted from sleep last night. For some <laughs> reason, I could not sleep. I would not recommend that. But, you know, even training, it, it does help train your body. And so, you know, those ex exposure, it, it's in a number of different things, mm. but definitely being able to overcome that and to clear, my, clear your mind, be able to think through it. And I agree. I think fasting is something that definitely would benefit a lot of people, yep. not just for a weight loss, but yes. also just a help, help win. Okay. Now number 10, and then we're going to go to some questions, but number 10 is honestly to me, the priority. Absolutely. Is the priority. And that's one of the 10 reasons why that you're going to fail is lack of faith, having lack of faith in anything. You know, guys, honestly, with, with the lack of faith and people have different opinions and beliefs and all that stuff. And so we're not going to get real specific, even though Robbie and I both are Christians. You know, it's and it's important for, you know, for us that, that that's our our, our uh, inspiration. But having a belief and a faith in a higher power that it's not just on you, that, you know, that there are you have a purpose in life is probably the biggest thing that you have something that you need to accomplish, that you have a reason to survive. It's not just survival of the fittest. It's, you know what? I'm not done yet. Yeah. And when it's time for me to go, I'll be gone. But until then, I'm going to keep working toward my goal. 
And it goes more toward an eternal type hope than even an earthly hope. That's right. So if you step in front of your wife when somebody's shooting and you take the bullet, you didn't do it just to leave your family there now without a, you know, you did the right thing. You stepped up and then, you know, you'll be blessed by that because you're, you're going along with, with faith and, and, you know, and it's a big deal, but a lot of times, you know, soldiers, and I don't think they still do this, but most of the time they'd get a small little new Testament and they'd stick it in their pocket or, you know, it's according to their faith, what they, they carried, but it gave them a lot of inspiration to keep going. And that is the biggest priority is having some faith in a higher power. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Could not agree more. Uh, that it, it truly gives you a a purpose in life, and and something that's more important than yourself. Well, you know, and two fear. You know, when you look around, you see all the stuff going on all around you, and you're going, "Oh my gosh, all this stuff!" And it's going. You know what? This is under control. Mm -hmm. It may not look like it's in control. It may look like it's out of control, but. There is going to be a day where all this settles in and, you know, you just got to look past just our brief lifetime. Yeah. You know, in a hundred years, we're all going to be gone. doesn't matter whether you've got, you can build fires like the best of them. And, you know, you've got all these survival <laughs> skills. You're, you're going to sooner or later, you're going to pass along. And so looking at life as just a temporary journey and then having something beyond that. If you're an atheist, you know, I mean, I'm not going to down you on it and there may be some things that you can do, but as far as for me being a Christian and, and being a, a man of faith, I can take comfort in a lot of these type things where without it, it would be hopeless. <laughs> okay. Let's go to a few more questions before we finish up. And, um, and that gave us 10. Mm -hmm. Walt says, is it impossible to maybe prep on your own and not do the neighbors? Can neighbors maybe be a liability? Sure. Neighbors can be a liability. Um, but this is the one thing, again, that Fafal talked about was what got them through. And he was in Buenos Aires where the neighbors got together and they helped protect each other. Uh, you know, you can't watch. You can't protect your preps 24-7. Uh, you know, and two, you have four or five people come up against you and you're going to be very hard pressed, especially if they're armed. Well, you know, something else to consider. And and I, I agree 100 percent that you can't do everything alone. You have to have others to work with you. But let's just say you are alone. You plant you plant a garden. You know, you've got you, you've got your family, you plant a big garden and you know, you've got this great looking garden that's just starting to come up. You and your family go to bed that night and deer get into your garden and literally eat every row of your crops down to the ground. Which we both had that to happen. Had it happen. And, and there goes your garden for the year. I mean, you can replant, but you know, you're, you're already a month and a half, two months into the growing season. And all of a sudden, all of your plants are gone. Everyone was asleep. No one was able to be out there and watch the garden. It's not like, you know, these roving bandits came in and, and robbed you or anything. The deer ate all your food and you know, you can be mad at it if you, if you, if you want to be, but at the end of the day, that's where having a group really comes into play because you can have extra people that can watch your garden, that can watch over things and make sure that you're safe and make sure you're protected. Well, and you have community, you have intelligence mm -hmm. communication around your area, you know, I mean, but you know, we've always, it, put together, you know, having a group of like-minded people, it does give you strength. Uh, can you do it alone? Yeah. I mean, you know, but it, it takes a special person to yes. really be able to do that. Yes. And you're going to have a lot of luck involved or blessing one or the other. But uh, I think it's important. Plus, let me tell you, say this, when you get somebody, your neighbor that doesn't have any food and he may be a great guy, may be a super nice guy. He's got kids, your kids play with his kids. They look at you and they go, you know what? They've got food. People are going to be extremely desperate mm. to the point that they will do things that they would never do before. And so it makes it very vulnerable. 
James W. Robinson says, big question. I will be stuck in my neighborhood. How do I cook or start a fire without alerting the entire neighborhood by the smell? Well, that's going to be difficult because, mm -hmm. you know, I've thought about that too. I mean, yesterday we grilled out steaks and man, that smelled good for two miles. Yes. <laughs> Um, you know, um, and two, if you have chickens or you have stuff, I mean, there's no a generator. I mean, there's a lot of noise producers out there that are related to survival. Um, you know, one thing again is if you're in an urban situation or a suburban situation, it's very tight. You know, you, you're going to have to figure it out. I mean, for us, we have people that live up and down our road and, um, thank goodness a lot of them actually have chickens and rabbits and different things, you know, uh, so they're, they're already thinking about it, but you're going to have people that are going to approach you that are, again, are going to be very desperate. So, um, it's going to be difficult, uh, especially when you have something that smells really good and it cooks. I know when I go home sometimes and there's something really smells good, I can smell mm -hmm. it from outside. Mm -hmm. You wait until there's, um, an SHTF situation where people's, senses are going to be heightened. Yeah. So, so you just have to be smart about it and, you know, make sure that you keep your, your spices down. You know, of course, cooking meat is just, it just carries that smell. A lot of vegetables too. Yeah. You know? A yeah. lot of vegetables still carry a, a really pungent smell that you can smell for a long distance. You know, during Vietnam, a lot of times the guys that would, they'd be waiting on an ambush and they'd have a VC column kind of come through and they could smell different things on them. They mm -hmm. could smell the food. They could smell the cigarette smoke they were smelling. I mean, they could smell these things yeah. even though they couldn't see them. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be tough, uh, you know, maybe boiling water and, and adapting to ways to cook that won't attract smell. Yeah. Boiling stuff is definitely going to be probably one, you know, water doesn't really um, smell, but you know, even when you're boiling things, sometimes that, that can smell. Yeah. So that's going to be a tough one. I mean, that that's definitely going to be something tough. But that's where you have good neighbors around you and you're working together. And maybe you're doing a big pot, like we talked about a few weeks ago, a big pot. And you're making some stew and people come over and you go, oh, here, here's your stew. And then you go back and get your steak. <laughs> uh, Ryan Burleson asks, Suits, you often recommend books. Have you read the Foxfire series? And if so, your thoughts on it as it relates today? If not... I would like to recommend the Foxfire series by Elliot Leamington. Yes, I have. I have read a couple of those books. I haven't finished it. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned it because I had honestly kind of forgotten about it. But let me just say this about survival. I, I, some of the best books that I've ever read, some of the best books were written in the 50s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Alas, Babylon. What a phenomenal book written in the 50s. I'm reading one right now. It's the parable of a sower of the sower. And honestly, to me, that's probably what is going. In fact, it's what is happening today. It's what is happening with crime going crazy, the homeless with crime, you know, with uh, loss of food or prices going way up. It's a parable of the sower. And uh, that is a phenomenal book. What I've done is I'll go on my top 10 list and of, um, you know, on Amazon or whatever of survival books and I'll find something and I'll order it. And man, there's some really great books there. It's not necessarily just the new modern take on survival and it kind of gets you back down to bare minimum, but yeah, the Foxfire series is great. Um, and I need to re up that uh, going home is great. Um, the John Wesley Rawls survivor series is fantastic. Uh, the, um, the G Gordon uh, or G Michael Hoff, the New World series, excellent. The tw the 299 Days uh, by Glenn Tate, awesome series. Boom, boom, boom. There's just a ton of different things out there. And guys, that's where, you know, you can really put together. This book right here is one of the most important books that you can get. And again, the link's down below in the description. I kept mentioning this every week, and I finally told Sarah Mack, I said, put that link in the description so people can find it. <laughs> but um, yeah, a lot of great books out there. Let's go to one more question. You're not saving? No, I read that. Oh, I guess I'm getting the sign that it's one o'clock and there you go. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we really appreciate you being here today. I hope that this was more of a mindset type uh, video, but 
Again, mindset is probably one of the most important things that you can start with and then put in the training and then action and put in your plan. I mean, there's a lot of action plans and things that you can do here. Get yourself in a good situation. Mentally prepare yourself, harden yourself mentally. And again, guys, don't forget a warrior is not born. You have to grow into it. And so you may say, well, you know, I don't have any experience. Well, neither did, you know, whoever insert their name. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. insert Robert E. Lee, you know, what, what a great, you know, general, but, uh, or Alexander the great or Neo or, or uh, Napoleon. Yes. They had definitely huge gifts, but they had to grow into it. And we all have to do that. So don't be worried. Don't look at yourself and say, I'm just an average guy. I don't know. Or an average girl. You can become an expert in a lot of different places, but you've got to put the work in. All right. We really appreciate Robbie for being here today. And uh, it's always good to have him here and uh, check out Wheaton Arms. Check out Robbie Wheaton's YouTube channel, Robbie Wheaton. And, uh, guns, you know, I didn't even say this. Gunsmith for over 20 years and really has a great insight on his gun reviews. Uh, and also Sarah Mack, we appreciate her for uh, the questions, monitoring things and watching over us. Also, Exotac, best fire starters on the market. Get a 20% off using Suits 20 with the link down below in the description. I mean, not only do they look cool, they're just awesome. <laughs> All right. So, guys, thanks for coming today. We really do appreciate it. So be strong. Be of good courage. God bless America. Long live the republic.